Okay, hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining for this special seminar. Uh, we, we, we rarely do these kind of, you know, in between seminars, but I, I couldn't resist. I just could not resist to bring Stephanie and Christelle here with us to chat and learn more about, about them, about what they're doing. Uh, and so just by, by introduction, my name is Faneuil, Chief Resident here at SAI. And um, today we are gonna have these two special presentations um, um, by two upcoming junior residents on the research uh, track whom I invited for, the, for them to share their research uh, interests or plans that they would wish to build at SAI. And so why is that? So SAI is an incubator and what we're trying to do is enable uh, both practitioners and uh, researchers to build the next generation of programs that interface between science and society. So research from my perspective are also programs, right? You have a lab, it's a research program that you're developing. If you're a practitioner, you're doing the same thing. You're building a nonprofit, you're building an initiative of some kind, it's also a program. And so ultimately though, you're trying to have an impact somewhere out there, whether it's through the publications, through the new knowledge you've created. And I think that that is of no difference in science communication, science engagement, and that's why we are also at SAI pursuing and really encouraging more fundamental research at the intersection between science and society. I believe not enough is being done. And so I, I'm creating this space where we can do that and, and encourage um, um, people to, and to, to participate in this endeavor. So with that, I, I would like to welcome our first uh, speaker. Uh, Christelle, you're gonna have to help me with your last name. Actually, I should have yes. asked you that earlier. No problem. It's, uh, it's Cri Crystal Chandra. So Chandra. TJ, yeah. So I'm originally from Indonesia. And so the last oh. name is actually an Indonesian last name. So TJ oh, okay. is pronounced like a C. Okay, yeah. it's a C. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to have to, I'm going to butcher that a couple of times, but I will get it. I promise. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> people, people have done my name also a number, but I, I better to ask than, than try to butcher people's names. Um, so uh, Christelle is actually at Stanford, uh, where I did my own PhD, actually, in the School of Medicine there, and she's a postdoc during the day, shall we say, and in the evenings and nights, she does many other things, uh, and one of them, which I came to learn about recently, is that she teaches <laughs> at San Jose State, and this is how, and I, I, the minute I learned about this, like, can you please send me your curriculum, and this is where I got to learn about Christelle's science communication passion. And there she's teaching undergraduates the art of communication, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Communicating, relaying scientific concepts. And, and I think there was an alignment immediately, thinking as well about our own summer program. And I knew that uh, this would be a fruitful conversation. And I actually got to learn even more about her own interests, research interests in this space. And I was hooked and I knew that I wanted to hear more. And so that's why... Crystal, <laughs> I would like to love to hear more and, and share with the residents some of the things, some questions that you wish to pursue uh, and welcome. Yeah, sure. I actually um, prepared some slides. So if I can get um, um, screen sharing access, that would be great. And then I'll bring up my Absolutely. slides. Absolutely. Yeah, there you go. Okay, let's see. So share screen. Okay, let me just do this. Okay, does this work? That's good. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so um, thanks again for having me. Really, I'm, I'm really excited for this um, because it's not very often that you find people who are like-minded, who are scientists or scholars who are very passionate about the intersection between um, scholarly pursuit, I would say, and civic engagement. And so um, before I start with my pitches, um, I just want to tell you a bit about myself. So about me, um, I am Crystal Chandra. Um, as I said, I grew up in Indonesia. So from elementary up to high school, I was in Indonesia. And then I made my first big move um, away from home when I pursue a Bachelor of Medicinal Chemistry in Australia. Um, and so I, I did my um, um, bachelor degree and went on and to, to do PhD in chemistry as well in Australia. 
And then after that, um, not enough moving, I actually made a, a second big move um, to California. Um, so I, I arrived in California in January 2020 um, to Stanford. Um, so I'm currently a postdoc scholar in the School of Medicine. Um, and like Fanuel said, I am also a current um, adjunct lecturer at San Jose State University, where I teach, uh, where I teach um, scientific communication. And so as a researcher, I am engaged in various kind of research, um, actively publishing, and so on. But uh, really what I want to highlight today is actually the things that I do uh, apart from research. So um, I guess from, from our previous conversation with um, Daniel, uh, this is kind of like the science adjacent um, exploration and engagement that I do apart from my own research. So um, just a few things that I do. Um, I am very um, passionate about science communication, science journalism. So um, starting um, 2020, I've been able to uh, write for a few different um, outlets um, on the intersection between science and um, public interest. Uh, so things like, you know, uh, misinformation in science or um, inclusion and diversity in science and really highlighting uh, the work of different uh, scientists. Um, apart from science journalism, I'm also interested in uh, science entrepreneurship um, and industry engagement. So I was uh, part of the Stanford Ignite, which is a, um, um, a, a one month um, engagement where um, they teach scientists like myself or uh, people from different um, degrees and backgrounds about, you know, the basics of entrepreneurship and how do you launch your own ideas. I'm also uh, part of different different uh, initiatives at Stanford, um, such as the Bioside Careers, uh, working with the Career uh, Center, thinking about uh, what, what are some of the um, activities or workshops that will be helpful for graduate students and postdocs. Um, just recently, I, I was involved in this um, Biotech Connection Bay Area, which is like a, a student-run nonprofit organization that links um, scientists to um, entrepreneurs. Um, so um, apart from that, um, science education. Um, so I think my love for um, science communication has really led me uh, to education. Um, and this is something that I've, I've started uh, this year. Uh, so teaching in San Jose State University. And ever since starting teaching, I've sort of fell in love with it and kind of want to learn more about it. And I think um, one of it is because um, it really, it, yeah, it really aligns with my values. So when I think about why do these, why do these involvements matter to me? Um, firstly, it's continuous learning. Um, I think communicating my research idea helped me put my thoughts in order. Um, compassion, um, really the dialogue between science and society um, is important for me, uh, for mutual understanding. I think as a scientist, um, who are uh, constantly developing a new technology or new solutions, new, new intervention. Um, it's really hard to know what's effective if you don't know the person or the target um, audience that you are kind of like doing this work for, right? Um, creativity, I think exchanging ideas um, with those who are outside my field really helped me uh, learn, uh, look at my own research from a different angle. Um, I also think that it is um, the scientist's responsibility to um, bring back their knowledge um, to the public. Uh, and obviously uh, we have um, really benefited from a lot of investment from taxpayers. And you know, this, is, this is just one way for us to be able to share our knowledge. Um, I find it rewarding, to be honest, uh, to be able to share my knowledge, whether it's through journalism, through education, um, or through entrepreneurship. Um, I really believe that um, as scientists um, who communicate, we really help towards uh, combating misinformation. And it's fun. Uh, it reminds me of the wonder of science. Um, whenever I see my, my students kind of um, get excited about uh, science, uh, it, it really feeds into my own um, energy. And so when it comes to higher ed journey, I, I talk about how I, I went from, you know, um, high school, uh, undergraduate, graduate, postdoc, um, and now thinking about beyond postdoc. Um, oftentimes, it kind of looked like this, right? It's like a leap. Um, you're not quite sure, you know, you know, when you're in undergraduate, 
uh, degree, you finish your degree, and then what's next? It's every time, every time you ask yourself, what's next? It's always a giant leap. And when there is a kind of a path, it's always framed at um, career or individual advancement. Um, but what I really want to challenge uh, people, and it also challenged myself into thinking about this, is that when we think about the transition, how do we see it as a civic advancement, not just individual advancement, right? So I feel like there is there is kind of a, a question mark here in terms of, okay, um, you want to create people who are um, capable, competent, um, and um, individual, um, individually uh, they're flourishing, but how do you also link that towards how they position themselves in the society, right? How do they still be um, an agent of change, right? Um, in wherever they go. And so um, this is sort of like some of the list of what uh, NACE, NAC, National Association of Colleges and Employers list as the competency um, for a career ready workforce. You know, this, is, this includes career and self-development, communication, critical thinking, equity and inclusion, leadership, professionalism, teamwork and technology. And these are all really, really great things um, that will make someone become career ready. But I would also argue that these are really important um, values and um, skills uh, for um, individuals to be a good citizen, right? Uh, to be able to bring back to the society. And so what I'm really pitching um, today um, is something that I kind of have thought about in the past uh, few weeks, um, an initiative where I, I can see a scientific ecosystem where people can be an engaged scholarship. So what does that mean? So some of the visions that I have um, thought about is uh, creating community of people who are ready to redefine academic success. Um, and so um, just, just a bit of a background um, in academia, there's a lot of kind of mentality around publish or perish. You know, you're, you're always kind of like uh, fighting for yourself and like uh, trying to make it. Um, but it, that kind of mindset, that kind of um, definition of success actually, I think, hinder people from actually looking at the big picture or um, how do they actually contribute in a, in a broader sense. Um, I'm also, um, one of my vision is also to create a meeting point for scholars who are engaged with the public, uh, scholars who are, uh, who continue to think about how, do, how would their work really affect other people in the society. And a platform for culturally aware and evidence-based interventions. Um, most of us who have gone through higher education, we are um, very much familiar with evidence-based approaches and evidence-based solutions. Um, so why not, when we're thinking about engagement, um, think about also evidence-based um, interventions? Um, and I put there culturally aware because I am, um, after you know, moving from different places, um, growing up in Indonesia, um, having my education in Australia, and now in in, in America, I. Uh, very, I'm, I'm, I'm very much aware that wherever I go, there's a cultural differences, right? There's, there's always, a, um, when you go into a different context, success looks different. When you go into a different context, engagement looks different, right? Communication also um, um, can be different. And so for, for me, um, this kind of initiative is kind of like a cycle, right? It will involve um, research, um, getting to know um, your subjects, um, getting to know what is needed. And then it needs um, equipping, so training people who are, who are interested in this kind of work um, and then testing it out, uh, right? So once we, we have done the research, equipping people, we need to go out there and really engage um, with the public. And then assessment, um, sort of like an introspection of whether or not our intervention actually um, was effective. And so if I can summarize, um, these are some of the ideas that I've, um, I've come up with. Uh, so firstly, research, it can be a survey of um, published uh, literature on various scholars engagement with the public, 
uh, synthesize some evidence-based interventions based on uh, what has been done out there. Um, and then maybe um, putting together all these um, interventions in terms of like white paper or peer reviewed article. Um, and then implementation, design and prototype different types of intervention uh, in the form of public engagement initiatives. Uh, partnering with people, we don't really have to like reinvent the wheel if there's already something out there. You can just partner with people who are, who are already doing um, this good work. Um, and then assessing, so post-engagement surveys, stats, um, writing a report on the evaluation. Um, and really, um, all these uh, obviously will need um, people, right? Uh, people who are also like-minded. Um, and so um, building a collaborative kind of lab or in this, uh, full of interdisciplinary scholars um, who can kind of uh, come together and think about uh, what's the best approach. And also um, after that, uh, providing training for uh, people who are maybe interested, but not yet ready uh, creating accessible training resources, maybe for um, younger generations like undergrads or high school students or people who are in grad schools, um, um, helping them to think about this a bit more and um, making their way, um, providing workshops or courses or just some, some of the options. Um, and so um, the goal really is to bridge scholars and society. Um, and so these are just reiteration from what I I've said from the previous um, slide, so I won't uh, spend too much time, um, but, but really, um, if I can boil it down to four different aspects, it's um, research, equipping, um, engagement, and assessment. And so um, these are the four, four things that I am hoping to be able to achieve. Um, so maybe at this point, um, you would ask, you know, what, what are some of the immediate next steps? Um, I think um, with these um, kind of ideas, I think they'll, they'll definitely need more um, um, research into, into this space, um, doing a, uh, a deeper dive into what's already out there, um, talking to more people, surveying, um, conducting inter informational interviews, uh, building connection uh, with like-minded individuals, learning from local career centers, um, at the university, um, there are already people who are already actively thinking about career advancement, professional development, um, refining some of the project ideas, and then um, finally seek funding uh, for this to be able to move forward. Um, so yeah, so those are those are my thoughts, um, and I'll just end there. Um, and yeah, keep the slide on. So and I welcome any questions or comments. Yay. Awesome. Okay. So part of this, uh, so thanks for that quick chalk talk. <laughs> I see Corey there with a quick clap. Um, now we get to take it apart a little bit uh, and see if we can uh, delve deeper. Um, uh, Stephanie, do you have any questions uh, or Corey or Ariana um, before, because I have, you know, I can usually have too many questions. So <laughs> I will, I will stop go there. First. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead if you have a question. So you can go first. Okay, okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, so no, this is fascinating because I was, well, as you were talking, I, I was like, you need to talk to Adriana. So she's building the Bankson Lab at SAI. I'm sure yeah. you've probably seen her work, right? Yeah. I think there's some overlap there, like a small overlap and in, in similar interests that I, I think, I love the way you're thinking about it from civic engagement point of view, right? And because and, uh, she's approaching it from workforce development. Mm -hmm. and then adding policy on top of it, thinking about what's the role of science policy in that, right? right? And so she's really building that um, portal. And I love the fact that you are doing both research and practice together, right? And that's, those are the two pillars. You, and I think you need both. You can't just do practice. You need to also have research and you can't just do research. You need to have the research lead to something, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And then both yeah. of you actually have um, that element, which I really, really love. Um, I was just curious in terms of, um, so you you label it as scientific actually you have it a scientific ecosystem for engaged scholarship right so these are these are scientists right or mm -hmm. are you thinking about others down that I hate to say pipeline yeah I'm initially thinking about uh, focusing more on scientists 
Um, and this can be scientists from various backgrounds. Um, um, so STEM um, related scientists, yeah. Okay, okay. And if you go back like two slides, and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll steal one extra question, Stephanie, then I'll let you. Um, so in the first tab, you have the research. Could you frame like a, uh, a question that you would like that would drive you first, like forward, that you say, okay, I want to, I want to understand X because we don't know this, right, in yeah. this space right now. Do, do you have a sense of that at this time? I'll have to get back to you on that, but that's yeah. Okay, uh, okay, I think Ariana yeah. is seconding my question <laughs> uh, because yeah. that's part of the like you know thinking about what are those questions, right? That will then give mm -hmm. you a line in, and I love when you say landscape, right? So the landscape there will be well. What is it that you want to understand better? So from Adriana, for example, Bankston, so she's trying to understand, okay, what is the field of training for like undergraduates in science policy? So she's been doing that and then building off saying, okay, is there a space here to create something? Yes or no, right? So in, right. Your, in your case could be like, okay, what do we know? And what are those mm -hmm. gaps here yeah. that then can lead into some discovery? Yeah, I guess one of the, one of the questions that came to mind would be, um, what are some of the factors that are hindering um, trainees, like scientists, trainees, um, from engaging with the public? Um, so I know that you know every time you ask people, you know, would you want to engage more? Or would you want to do outreach? People will most likely say yes, um, but why? Why is it that not everyone's doing it, right? So uh, maybe that's one of the questions. Um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, Stephanie. I guess in terms of um, looking at like the different careers that potential people will go into, I guess like how do you make sure that you're not going throwing too broad of a net and like how are you actually creating interventions that kind of like, you know, what is going to be your test subject or test or test outlook or whatever or focus of, of career in order to, to kind of hone in on your on your assessments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a great question because um when it comes to trying to get people from different stages of the career, obviously um, it's really hard to just pinpoint on one population. Um, yeah, I haven't thought about that actually. Yeah, I'll, I'll need to think about that, yeah. Corey, was there a question there? No. Uh <laughs> Yeah, more of a comment. So, uh, hi, Crystal, that was great. And uh, so for context, I, I've, I've organized a whole bunch of TEDx events. And so I'll focus more on the uh, mechanics of the presentation mm -hmm. uh, piece. So um, th there there was a lot of content on the slides mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it felt very logically organized, um, but I, I didn't really feel a clear sense of, of narrative. Right. So, mm -hmm. that, like, mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I'll always tell my speakers is that that you're you're trying to tell people a story, you're trying to uh, it, it give them an idea and uh, it have something that they can take away from. And mm -hmm. so, one exercise that I'd uh, give for you is just write down in a single sentence mm -hmm. what is the one idea you want people to take away from your presentation. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's helpful comment. Yeah, and I think because be the beauty about this is there's a lot of lines here that you could extract from, right? And saying like, okay, I want to look at this thing here, right? Study this thing, and I'm trying to even think about you know the course you're teaching because there's some I mean, there are links there clearly, right? You mm -hmm. talk about those barriers. Right? To my question, you say what are those barriers that are in place, right? Mm -hmm. And that could even be a whole line, right? To mm -hmm. Corey's point that. What is the one thing that people should leave? Like, well, we are trying to figure out what these barriers, we want to understand the barriers, how they develop, how they form, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the ways that we can break them down. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that gets you, and then you can build a whole story around that. Even your whole lab could be around that, right? Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. For my lab at SAI, I focus wholly, so I'm, I'm a, I consider myself a developmental psychomist, <laughs> if you will. Because I, I am fascinated with how ideas in this space, organizations develop, how mm -hmm. they are born, 
how they exist and how they die. Mm -hmm. That's it, right? And I can extract, oh, Corey, thank you very much. <laughs> and then from, from that, you can then look at my work that I've built. Literally everything is stemming from that thread, you know? How do, you know, what is created? What are, the, what are those barriers, right? And there's like a subfield there. What are those barriers that are created? Where are they born? What inspires, right, to create them? And that's really the genesis of SAI, in fact. That's why my lab is like built like that <laughs> because that's my main interest, right? And so um, I think there's some really wonderful um, inquiry lines you, you could extract from this. And, and so it's really exciting to see what you land on. <laughs> you know, and, and extract from that. Um, because I think there's, there's something there for sure. Um, any other, uh, Ariana, sorry, my view doesn't show. Do you have a question or comment? Uh, or any, anybody else actually? Uh, well, fan was still my question, but <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think this is a great starting point. I think something that kind of came to mind, cause I'm, um, I'm working on my PhD now and something that kind of came to mind in the conversation and maybe you can like look into it is like how how someone's how a scientist's like ability to engage with the public kind of differs at different levels mm -hmm. of their career and how those levels of career have like impacts that process because as a grad student I think a lot of the outreach things kind of get pushed onto us from the faculty but mm -hmm we see the faculty as the people with like the power and the resources. So I think it's kind of an interesting thing that maybe you could study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. That's a really good point. Awesome, awesome. There's, there's lots here where we can spend all day long. <laughs> um, uh, I'll leave the photo to Christelle. Is there any, anything else you wanted to share? Um, uh, no, yeah. um, apart from just thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. for the space and for the for the input yeah I'll, I'll keep on working on the idea um and hopefully you know we'll, we'll present something more mature at some point mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and i think this is the, the point of this building out and for those of you who don't know sai has this massive library that we've been accumulating that is actually publicly accessible by the way um <laughs> so there's a lot of material there to use and extract and build from. Um, so I'll share with you that um, as well. But thank you for that, uh, Crystal. Okay, so up next, um, Stephanie, Stephanie, Stephanie Castillo. So we met, I'm trying to remember when, we met through the, uh, I think I stumbled upon future, future doctors at that point, right? You're a graduate student and you're doing lots of things, but I came across this and, I, and I, we were building for my lab, the journal of stories and science. And so there was a connection there that I knew, okay, can we collaborate somehow? And you know, fast forward years later, you ended up creating your own PhD uh, track at Vanderbilt to, to graduating recently. Congratulations, uh, Dr. Castillo, officially. Uh, a PhD in SciComm. I mean, rarely do you ever hear a, a student creating their own PhD and yet alone then graduating from that track, you know. And so uh, over the years, it's wonderful to, to have seen you grow. Uh, I think our last in-person connection was in Hawaii uh, at SACNA. So um, it's great to just see the growth and, and see where you're going. I will, I will not steal the thunder in terms of some of the ideas that we've talked about over the years. Uh, so I'll leave that to you. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm excited always just to be a part of this community and for just having you in my life on well, because you're just a very, um, yeah, just have served like as a great mentor throughout my time. Um, especially when I had to make that pivot to science communication. But yeah, just really kind of excited to kind of share an extension of what I started during my PhD. And so um, this is kind of like the cliff notes of the, of the dissertation, kind of like what, what I uh, found and what I ex hope to expand upon being a part of the residency for SAI. And so, um, so I already have the introduction, but what my initiative is, is Future Doctors. It's a, um, it's a, a digital media company that's changing the face of science one video at a time. The goal is to inspire and to motivate the next generation of young students that are wanting to, or hopefully to get them to consider careers in STEM. And so this initiative was kind of built upon my own personal experience going 
um, from undergraduate institution, uh, becoming wanting to become a chemist, um, to you know, taking that leap that Christelle mentioned earlier, taking that leap into like being a graduate and to a graduate student to further develop my career as a scientist. But um, coming from, um, I'm a Latina woman, I grew up in Florida, a lot of diversity there. And then there was a big culture shock once I got into graduate school, which was in Tennessee. And um, when I came into my program, I was like only one of three women invited into, or one of three women accepted into my cohort and only one of uh, uh, two students of color. And so, this lack of representation or a lack of diversity per se in, in my cohort was a reflection of the faculty and the staff within these departments. And then kind of digging a little bit deeper into kind of like, you know, why is this, you know, this was such a shock to me, culture shock to me, uh, doing a little bit more research, I've noticed that the lack of representation that I'm personally experienced is a reflection of the science and engineering workforce, especially in the United States, with only uh, what it's recently slowly have grown since, um, since like the two that like 2015 says that there's been more initiative and more push for it. But for right now, we still stand at kind of like 10% Hispanic and Latin, Latinx student of uh, Latinx people and also 8% black people. And then of course, always a small representation of indigenous and Pacific Islanders in this space. And so seeing this, seeing this problem, at least at the bigger scale and to the workforce, I had the next question is to figure out like, where is this actually happening at? And so, According to the National Center for Education Statistics, there is an example of say there's like 13 million uh, students in public high schools uh, that are from like Latinx Hispanic uh, Hispanic backgrounds, and of those, 82% of them will go on to graduate high school, and then from that, you know, 30 less than 30% will go on to enter college, and then those that ended up graduating with a degree in STEM is less than 2%, and that just continues to narrow down into having those that are actually graduating with a PhD. And so I'm part of the rare, the rare numbers of 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 um, you know doctorate holdings that are are from that are Latinx, and so. There's a variety of factors, especially in the education system, that kind of play into um, what causes students to leak out of the, the STEM pipeline. And of those factors, I wanted to focus into the fact that there is a lack of role models in these spaces and having negative stereotypes projected onto marginalized students within the classroom. And so this is a great quote that I got from uh, one of the literature papers that I forgot the author, but one of the literature papers that I, I use as a, a foundation for my research. And it says that if students hold stereotypes that portray scientists as a different kind of person than themselves, then those students might not conclude that they are science people. So again, if we're having negative stereotypes projected onto them, they're not having these role models in these spaces, then like, you know, are they really going to think like, okay, this is for me, you know, and that's what I wanted to continue to explore using future doctors as kind of like my platform. And so I future doctors wasn't just kind of like an out of the whim thing. This lack of representation that I'm seeing within my university and within the science and engineering workforce is also reflective in the content that we consume in popular media. So on science YouTube, there are tons of, there are hundreds of science YouTube channels and those that are generating, generating millions of views, you know, often don't really reflect me or usually their audiences also are mostly college educated white men that are watching this type of content. And so, um, there is a study done by Anoka and Grant where they looked into the gender discrepancies of like the hosts that are hosting these YouTube channels and of like almost 400 YouTube channels that they explored, only 32% of them were, were hosted by women. And there has still yet to be any research done on um, on like racial and ethnic representation and any other types of, of, of marginalized types of groups to look into these science YouTube channels. And so that's kind of where I sought to start at Future Doctors. And so this initiative that I did as like a side project to kind of continue to get me passionate and excited about the research or the science that I was doing in graduate school, and eventually realized that I enjoyed this much more and left my chemistry PhD program to do my science communication, uh, to do, you know, pitch to science communication track and convert my idea of starting a YouTube channel, which increases racial racial and ethnic representation in this space and really understand like, what does it mean does representation really matter? And what does it mean to the audience that I'm trying to target, especially if I'm trying to motivate or inspire younger minds? And so with any science communication project that we do, there is a strategy that we usually follow. And kind of like what Crystal mentioned before is really identifying our audience. So my audience was gonna be um, high school students or young adults kind of like entering the college. Uh, I was aiming for this space just because I feel like 
at least from personal experiences. Um, usually it's who you know within your own community that you kind of are inspired by to do the careers that they're doing and, um, and whatever you're exposed to. So if marginalized or, or students that are in low resource areas don't really have access to like what the potential careers are. So maybe high school will be a way that I can intervene at, intervene at that stage. Um, and then same thing for undergraduates, even though they have established maybe themselves of a as a science person or into a STEM degree program, there's still so many careers that we're not exposed to that we're aware about. So maybe my, my you know, my I can provide a resource for these for these students. And so my main topic was to use my use future doctors as a science or a STEM to introduce STEM role models and also be a tool or a resource for career exploration. And then uh, I wanted to, um, and then trying to find where my audience is, a lot of teens are using social media where there is a study done by the Pew Research Institute that at least over 70% of, you know, young adults or teens are on these types of platforms. And so, and then as my personal initiative or my personal, not initiative, but my own, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? But like, for myself, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be in the science YouTube space to kind of create you know, a wedge into this space. And so video was the platform that I was using. So with all these idea in mind, all these ideas and kind of strategy in mind, the last thing that I really needed to hone in on was the messaging. So how am I actually going to inspire or to motivate young adults to do this? And how, you know, and I can't just present to them a science video, like what does it actually mean to actually grasp their attention and actually target them with the videos that I'm trying to produce? And so um, a lot in science communication is always centered around storytelling as a, as a tool. And a lot of uh, we use storytelling in science communication in different types of degrees. But for the most part, we at least think of our storytelling in four types of sets or four types of sections. And so we have the setting. So where is like, where is the science taking place? What is kind of like the background or the context of the science we're talking about? Who is the character, whether that be abstract of like an actual cell that we're following, or in my case, a scientist that we're following. And then the plot. So it's the, so what, why should we, why should students care to watch these videos? And then what do I want students to walk away with learning or knowing, which is the moral of the story. And so there's a lot of uh, studies that have already been done in terms of like communication uh, in general or like in media studies that have uh, demonstrated that like narratives and storytelling can be used as a tool to transport people into the story, get them connected into the story or even relating to the character and by identifying with the character, then they can also change their either their attitudes, their behaviors or just even their perception or misconceptions. So with this in mind, the main research question that I was exploring as a, as a graduate student was, you know, how do young adults identify with different narratives and racial representation in these science videos? So if my goal was to change the face of science, again, does representation really matter? And if I'm trying to um, motivate or inspire, you know, like how can it, how do different types of stories, you know, what, what do they evoke? What do they evoke? So I produced two different videos. Uh, featuring the same character. My character was Dr. Corey Grayson, who just so happens to be a black woman. She is a biomedical engineer at Vanderbilt University and Cornell University. And so I had her as my, my, my main character. So I produced two different videos where I was testing out the two different narratives. So the narratives was science-centered. So I only focused on Dr. Grayson's research and the impact and like the motivations behind the research and how the research works, the science works. And then the other one was scientist-centered. So scientist-centered was learning, was kind of focused on Dr. Grayson herself and like her journey into and motivations as to why she became a scientist, why she decided to study the, the prostate cancer, which was like her, her research focus and um, kind of like follow her personal journey into becoming a scientist. And so I don't go into the full research study, but essentially I sent out a survey, I designed a survey that collected both quantitative and qualitative data supported by STEM identity theories and, uh, and typical media practices in terms of production and measuring impact. And so I uh, surveyed about 200 undergraduate students, early undergraduate students, um, and from those responses, the quali I wanted to really focus on the qualitative data in my, in my dissertation. So the qualitative feedback that I, I got was asking them what moments did they like uh, from each of the videos. So they were, the videos were randomized in the survey. So half of the students would wa watch the science-centered and the other half watched the scientist-centered. 
And so uh, the qualitative responses I collected was what moments did they like? What moments did they did like? Dislike, did like, dislike. <laughs> and then um, what did they learn about it? And what did they find relatable about the character? In this case, the scientist, and, which is Dr. Grayson. And so I'm just gonna give like an overview of kind of the responses that I got. And so when it came to the likes, the categories of likes kind of fell into two different types of categories. So there's people, there are students that commented on the production element, which is like, they like the graphics, the visuals, the audio, like more of the technical way of how the video was made. And then the other half of the students commented on like the actual narrative, which is kind of like the context of the story of like, oh, this was, I really liked learning about, you know, the prostate cancer or, you know, the topic or how the science was explained. And so some example, some example, um, uh, oh, what I have here. Uh, okay, so this is what kind of, or this is kind of what I just said. <laughs> so yeah, this is kind of like a nice table to, to summarize what I just said. And, or no, no, actually, let me go back really quick, sorry. Um, so when it came to liking what they liked in, in terms of these two categories for science-centered and scientist-centered, uh, when it, when I presented the science-centered video, more of the student, students commented on liking the production elements over commenting on like the narrative elements of the story. Whereas when they watched students who watched the scientist-centered video, less of them commented on the production element and more of them commented about the narrative. Um, I know I'm not able to show you the video because it's going to take some time, but I guess I didn't really, I didn't realize I gave like a summary about it. But so for the scientist centered one was kind of like a typical science explainer where we see on YouTube where there's a host. So me, the host is introducing this researcher and where she, the Dr. Grayson is the subject matter expert. And we're going to learn about her research, which is on prostate cancer. And I use like visual graphics, stock footage of like cells. And I have animations in there to explain how her therapy that she's using for prostate cancer is actually treating, uh, treating late stage prostate cancer and the impact that this research is having. In the scientist's narrative, it's just following Dr. Grayson in the lab, kind of like very low key in terms of Dr. Grayson introduces the fact that she never really knew she wanted to be a scientist. It was just a subject that she kind of liked um, and that um, it wasn't until she got into college from her counselor kind of supporting her that she met her first uh, black professors being kind of like an HBCU and seeing like this woman, um, this like unapologetically black chemistry professor and inspiring her to like really enjoy chemistry. And that's what kind of catapulted into her wanting to become a scientist and pivot her track from wanting to be a med student to being like a full on researcher. And then from a personal experience her, her grandfather and her father um, both have dealt with prostate cancer. So that's what drew her to wanting to do that research. And so um, some comments that I got in terms of what students liked from the production elements when it came to the science-centered video is that they liked the graphics and the footage, how the scientists were presented on screen, which is either me and Dr. Grayson talking on camera or just Dr. Grayson talking to the camera, and then the animations that I used to describe how the science worked in our research. Um, when it came to uh, the production elements for a scientist-centered, uh, comments mostly revolved around like they liked the overall aesthetic, the cinematography of it. They liked seeing Dr. Grayson being in the lab and also images of the people that influenced her journey. When it came to the content, the narrative of these videos, students mostly commented on what they liked was how well the science was explained and how interesting the topic was. And then when it came to the scientist one um, is they really liked uh, a lot of students liked the different elements of her journey. So, you know, some of the hardships or her decision to switch. And she also shared about her perspective as to like why she felt it was important for her to be in STEM um, as a black woman. And then there is moments, the same categories were still in play when it came to dislikes, uh, but there are, the dislikes were very few and far in between. Uh, just like a, a small handful of students commented that they did like them disliking visual elements. And so this was mostly kind of like constructive feedback to me as the producer of these videos. And so what they didn't like about my science censored one was that um, some of the audio quality was pretty poor or I had some decor decorative uh, uh, visual elements that were kind of distracting or sometimes I was talking too much on screen. It was just not dynamic enough. Um, for elements that they found that it, they didn't like about the scientist-centered one was that sometimes they felt that Dr. Grayson was pretty monotone in her speaking or wasn't engaging enough. Um, and again, there's some moments where the audio quality was pretty poor. 
when it came to the dislikes of the narrative in the science-centered one, this one was pretty funny to me because some students said that the explanations were too simple where other students were saying this was too difficult or confusing to understand. Um, and then for the scientist one, uh, there was a few handful of students who didn't really like the fact that Dr. Grayson was talking about her race and felt like we were pu pushing like a, a social a social justice narrative instead of just focusing on her journey as a scientist. Um, and then the question, the next question that I asked was, what did they learn? This question was mostly to make sure that the objective that I set for myself in producing these videos, that the students are actually walking away with the moral of the story of like what I wanted them to walk away with. And so for the most part, when it came to the science centered one, uh, the students, what they wrote for what they learned matched up to the main objective that I set out for them, which is to understand, you know, Dr. Grayson using these small biological particles to treat late stage prostate cancer. For the science, scientist centered one, that one was a little bit more complex. Um, I just wanted them to learn about the motives behind why Dr. Grayson decided to become a scientist, where students were very specific on like identifying specific elements of her journey and what they learned from those elements. So I feel like from this feedback that I made my objective, objective too broad. Um, so it wasn't really specific enough to kind of hone down like the narrative of her story. And then for the last one was what's, what did they find relatable about Dr. Grayson? This is kind of like a word cloud to kind of represent uh, what students were saying between science and scientist. At first glance, it kind of seemed like they, they related to the same kind of elements in terms of liking the science, liking the research, seeing the fact that, you know, they liked the fact that she was a woman of color, a woman in STEM, um, and that she was passionate and wanted to help people in this in this in in STEM in general, or like as her research or science initiative of what she was wanting to achieve. Um, but upon further inspection of looking into the like how like what the like students were actually saying, there was five different themes that I came up uh, that came about. So this is just kind of like a summary of what those themes were. And so students either commented on the relating to her character, so her character being like, she's passionate, she's driven, she, you know, they're like very descriptive words, like she's, um, she's a helpful person, she's a problem solver. So like mostly like comments on her character. And so when it, um, communication was like how well, like they liked how well she present, like how well she talked or presented about the science. Um, or they related to her journey, again, like her pivoting her career or finding people that helped her and mentored her. Um, physical traits were like, oh, she's a woman of color, I'm a woman of color, or that she's a, you know, a, she's part of a marginalized community, or she is a woman in STEM. And then all, uh, and the last category and theme was like her motives and her interests. The fact that she was interested in cancer, interested in, you know, uh, prostate cancer, in interested in like helping people or like doing stuff within the medical field that's not actually becoming a doctor. Um, and so we can kind of see the comparison between the different the different videos and how the themes kind of played about. And so I think the most interesting one is the fact that students, there was no comments on Dr. Grayson's journey in the science narrative because that wasn't the focus. And so students mostly focused on like how she presented herself when she talked about science. And then when it came to the journey, you know, no one talked about like, oh, she was good at talking about science. They were like, oh my goodness, no, I related to her journey and that was the main focus. And so I think that's the... But in commonality, the physical traits of like, again, like the descriptives of, of, who, of who she is person, like what you see. And then um, also her motives were kind of like in second place of like what students related to. And so for the, the what I kind of concluded from this, again, I'm only evaluating the qualitative data. Uh, there's no better narrative versus the other. They both serve different types of purposes. And I feel like knowing, understanding that we can kind of better help other science communicators, other producers to really hone in on what their messaging is and what they're trying to achieve. So if my goal is to introduce students to a new field of research, then I'm most likely going to go for a science-centered narrative, focusing on like the topic at hand of how the research is actually working and the impact of that. If I'm only trying to um, you know, introduce that. But again, if I'm trying to introduce role models or like, you know, 
maybe reassure marginalized students that like not all of our careers are linear and like all of our, our you know, we can, even if we're all unique, some of our, our journeys is the same, then maybe the scientist centered narrative is the way to go. And with my question of wanting to see if representation matters, that one is kind of like left on the end because it's not really something that I can pull from since all of my responses are anonymized, but that leads me to kind of like my future directions. So I have this data that I'm sitting on that I'm just not really doing anything with. So the goal is to kind of see if there's any correlation to the demographics of the students that I collected and the responses of like, you know, were more women liking the scientist narrative versus the science narrative or, you know, um, you know, or more women, you know, women of color are the ones that are relating stronger to Dr. Grayson. Uh, so that's kind of like the next steps that I want to do with the research. And then uh, the limitation of my research is the fact that I was testing this on undergraduate students who are already in STEM majors. And so they're all, I'm not going to be able to motivate or measure motivation after just one video and also with students who are already have kind of like a strong science identity. So the goal is to kind of go, go to the younger ages, to the, you know, freshmen, sophomores of high schools that have, or they're still kind of figuring themselves out or figuring out their interests and actually testing these videos out to them. And again, like the future big vision will be like, again, I can't just change someone's mind after one video. Like how does a library look like and the students exploring this library or like, you know, different types of stories throughout a long period of time and seeing if that changes any kind of motivation or any behavior or any kind of shift in perspective. Um, and then maybe like outside of the research in terms of like my broader impact is the fact that like we're not all, you know, as science communication becomes bigger, multimedia becomes bigger, um, using my research as a, as a way to inform the practice of other people wanting to produce videos and hoping to train other, other aspiring science com communicators to really evaluate how they're, they're doing their messaging and the audience they're trying to target. And, um, you know, like what would be the best way to go about it and just through training and through providing resources or tutorials. And, you know, the whole dream of this is again to kind of build my media platform, which is future doctors to have a to be a resource a career a career resource for uh, high school teachers or anybody else looking to implement career exploration in stem and in their into their classrooms. With that being said, I just want to thank you all for your time and I kind of went over 15 minutes, but thank you for your attention. Absolutely. No, that was great. That was great. You gave us so much uh, stuff to take apart. Um, uh, as always, I will refrain and ask others if they have questions before I dive in. <laughs> Feel free to throw uh, any questions. Christelle, yeah, th thanks, Christelle. I know you have to go. Uh, we'll, we'll share the video shortly. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I just want to say this is a fantastic idea. Um, you know, huge congratulations for finishing that project, and really excited about what you do with it in the future. Thank so, you. Thank yeah, you. I'm sure we'll cross path again. But um, for sure, yeah. for sure. See you next time. Nice meeting All you. Right. Nice meeting everyone. Bye. Thanks, Gustel. Um, okay, so I will shoot one as if, if there is no one. Okay, so. Um, yeah, there's there's lots in here, right? That you can take apart, and mm -hmm. I think the thing that came to mind was like, think of the Castillo Lab, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? What like someone is coming to your lab? What are you telling them about what the Castillo Lab is doing? In a few one or two sentences. Yeah, again, I don't know. I think mostly would be, um, we use inclusivity and DEI as kind of like buzzwords now, but we're not actually doing anything to actually measure that impact. And I feel like we're actually, my lab would actually measure this impact by actually taking it to the classrooms and the audiences that we're actually trying to target and using that to inform the practice that we're doing instead of just um, tokenizing ourselves and again, adding to the stereotypes that we can kind of do in media. And so I feel like that's what um, the new, you know, what novelty that I'm, I feel like I believe I'm bringing to the table. Which, which is interesting because from my end, give, given what you told me about what you do and so forth, I have this video, like the aspect of video stuck in my mind, right? I'm thinking, so there's a role of video in this somewhere, yeah. right? Clearly that's your, that's your training. Uh, you, you know how to do that very well, right? Yeah. So is that a utility? Maybe is the Castillo Lab using that as a, to try to understand like what is the role of video, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? The power mm -hmm. of video to understand how, how can we use it to right, to enact change, to enact, um, you know, to to 
to inspire the next generation or so forth, right? Yeah. And so, because I think, I don't know this space very well, right? Could that be an avenue of exploration to say, so, hey, it, what is the role of video in this space, right? And your own publication that you that you actually released, by the way, congrats uh, in, in May, right? So in that article, the title, I'll read the title out loud here quickly, Production Processes for Creating Educational Videos, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm already thinking you can add a bunch of subtext in there, right? How, like, how do you create? How are they being created right now, right? What's the traditional path? Is it working, mm -hmm. right? You can take your, what you've amassed right now with the data and say, well, I'm not the only one doing this. Mm -hmm. There are others, right? What are they doing? What is their approach? And are we, are we all heading right this way or are we all heading in multiple ways? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I think you have so much in there. I'm curious, where is your mind? If if I push you a little bit, I'm saying like, where's the, what's the role of video in this in your lab? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I actually have a friend who's in the science communication and like digital media space as well, and she recently came out with like a landscape study to see to explore other content creators or filmmakers and like what their own purpose was in produce and using videos as a tool for them. And so I think um, a lot of it is always informed of like the traditional practices that we do kind of like in Hollywood and filmmaking. And we kind of stick to like this, like the formulas that we see work well, especially when it comes to like conservation videos and, and like, you know, like the, the, the Nat Geo type videos. Um, and then that's kind of is almost establishing itself too, in terms of YouTube, because YouTube even though there's a diversity of different channels on there, there's almost like a rest a formula, a formula uh, a formula and style that continues to kind of be repetitive and, and, you know, influence other people's way of how they do science YouTube. And so I feel like, again, with those, keeping that in mind, people repeating like the same format, at least in science YouTube, they're only attracting for the most part, one type of demographic to watch these types of videos. So I think that's all something will be interesting to look into. Like, can, is there a different style or format that we can explore and seeing like, if, you know, if, if students are gravitated to animations, like, you know, like what will be the different elements that we can include into this video and changing maybe the way that it's presented um, to kind of like, yes, yeah, a peak, a new audience or spark a new interest or provoke a different emotion. I think that's something to kind of explore. I don't know, but I feel like. I, I, I love that actually, that, that there's something there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it is, but mm -hmm. what you, the last line of inquiry here it was very specific, I think. It, it, gave, it became closer to saying, okay, the Castillo Lab is in this space, right? Looking, using videos, right? And then Psycom to understand how are they being used? Uh, if this is landscape study, for example, mm -hmm. I, I would like read that in detail, figuring out where are the gaps, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there other questions that we're not asking, for example? Yeah, because right I'm now most... Uh -huh. So no, go ahead. No, no, talk about the audience, right? As well, like studying the audience itself, mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. to figure out, like who are these audiences, right? Especially in this realm. Uh, Corey. Uh, hey, Stephanie, so uh, great presentation. Uh, I, I watch way too much science YouTube content, so I'm sure we could talk about this forever. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can only imagine. And, yeah, and uh, it, so, but I'll, I'll stick to kind of my lane uh, as the uh, speaker coach here. So um, <laughs> the, 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 so the main thing is that um, I, I thought that the presentation was very good. You're clearly very confident in what you're speaking about. You understand the material. Um, all of that is great. Um, and, and there was a narrative arc, but it, it kind of got muddled in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I, I think like you had something like 50 slides. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of slides to get through. Yeah. So like my recommendation would be to pare that down mm -hmm. um, and like uh, one thing that you, you talk about is, uh, it, what is that there's a certain format um, in, in that YouTube format, kind of one thing that is there is mm -hmm. this implicit level of trust. Mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. There's an implicit level of trust that the person that's presenting to you knows what they're talking about mm -hmm. and uh, that you're coming along for the ride. Yeah. And so I, I feel, I think that you have this, uh, this academic mind that is so analytical and and you're coming at it from the frame that like I need to provide you with all of the evidence so that you can come up with your own conclusion um to do, do to like determine that that yes in fact the Castillo lab is the thing that you should be doing but really it they're going to trust you they're going to come along for the ride mm -hmm. 
-hmm. as long as you tell them and you bring them along for the journey. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to show them so much evidence. You need to show them enough to bring them along for the journey okay. and then come along at the conclusion and really tell them, here's the thing that I want to tell you. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. And the cool thing about us, of course, you know, we, I don't mind the meat today, uh, Stephanie, right? T -t today we wanted the meat because uh, I wanted to see what's in the under the hood, right? Open it up yeah. and to see what uh, is down there. And, and so it's cool to see that. Um, uh, Ariana, I don't know if you had a question, comment. Um, um, well, I just want to say I've followed you for a while and I've also followed Dr. Grayson for a while. So it was cool to kind of see it all come together. Um, I, my only thoughts were like, I think it would be cool because I was thinking back to like my high school experience. It was like, like reaching out to like high school counselors. And like in my high school, we had like, uh, like minority groups for both the, like girls and boys so I think it'd be a cool opportunity to kind of like show them what you're working on and because like nobody told me how to be a scientist when I was like 16 so yeah. I just thought that'd be a cool opportunity yeah so yeah I like that was I, I got to at least for a little bit of my dissertation I got to go to a high school and um test it in front of like three or four different class or actually six different classes um that's also data I'm kind of sitting upon but that was only like one metro nashville school and so there's definitely room to like you know the nashville schools here again like the lack of representation that i experience is also a reflection of the community in the town that i live in and so seeing like how does that affect like students that are in rural places or um or more privileged charter schools you know like how does like how does that actually change um and who is it actually impacting and so um yeah a lot of questions that we can always be diving into in terms of science communication yeah, and, and let me let me push this a little bit. In that um, broad study you mentioned, the landscape, like what, what were the key takeaways from? I don't know if you've read it or you've reviewed it in detail yet. Um, oh, was, the one that I mentioned, uh, yeah, Ray Matufi's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So her um, that one I think was mostly uh, the main takeaways was that like a, a kind of speaking to what um, to what Corey was mentioning of like people kind of taking us along on the journey and, and, and trusting us and kind of like having these quite inquisitive questions and we're all figuring out together. A lot of uh, the takeaways was kind of showing that a lot of these content creators or filmmakers are not, their, their main goal isn't to have an impact. Their main goal is to do something that's creative that they find that they're curious about. And again, taking those people with them and that's how they're kind of building their, their content and their development and their trust and their presence and their branding. And so it's not always about like changing behavior or changing, uh, you know, changing attitudes. Because again, that's always harder to measure and also, and also hard to do with just one video, especially if people are doing different types of videos uh, on their channels. And so I think most of it was kind of showing, was just kind of getting an understanding of like, what are the, damn, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of the intentionality. What are the intentions? That's the word I was looking for. What are the intentions of these filmmakers? Um, and you know, what it like, what are, what are their intentions before they like pick up the camera and film something? Um, and, or why they even want to do science filmmaking in the first place. So I think that was mostly the, the main takeaways of the landscape study. Yeah. And so, so I think there's, there's a lot in there you can extract. So it sounds like you're seeing a ton of data right now, right? So maybe the Castillo lab and the first, whatever X number of months, we'll be trying to parse that out to see if there's anything you can extract from that. Mm -hmm. um, there is an avenue in terms of the audience themselves, learning more about them. So I don't know this space could be, do we know, what do we know about the audiences and what they want in terms of videos and, mm -hmm. and their role in SciComm, right? Mm -hmm. What is the, maybe a question could be phrased like, what is the role of videos in SciComm, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and to Corey's earlier point, and I think this is still valid here, even as your coach, uh, speaker coach, Corey, right? You can, you can say even scientifically, Stephanie, right? Is you have to kind of home down on a like a fundamental question, yeah. right? That then drives all these, um, you know, or, or a set of them, like specific mm -hmm. aim, one, two, three. Uh, one could be more technical, another one could be more X and Y, right? <laughs> and that's all fine, right? So you just have to find those um, key anchor points yeah. that will allow you to um, extract these questions. That can lead, and this is the key, that, that can lead into potential publications, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And there are really cool avenues. You already are in one, the CBE Life Sciences, right? Mm -hmm. That they would love to say, hey, this is actually useful, new, useful information 
that, hey, actually we thought audiences wanted X. It mm -hmm. turned out they want Y. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the thing that I think there's so much uh, potential here, right? To impact both the creators and also for the audiences, uh, sci scientists broadly, right? Who are trying to do SciComm to learn like, okay, I need to, I, ca I can just do what, you know, what's being done all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I got to think deeply here about my audience, do X, Y, and Z. And so you can make recommendations, right? It's, it's, it's amazing what you could do here. It's crazy. So the Castillo Lab has a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, you're lot. hyping me up too much. <laughs> you know, but, but that's the thing. So you, but you still have to, you have to get that into a lane, okay? Yeah. So that, because yeah. you can't do everything. Yeah, for sure, for you, sure. You really can't. Like, like representation is a big, big animal, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I think anchoring it within the video domain gets you closer mm -hmm. and then you got to push some more <laughs> and then you'll find it is actually easier to then go broad once you're down there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, well, thank so, you for the feedback. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, absolutely. and I, I just, I just like to, as someone who watches a lot of this content, what, like, why, why do you think that there is a lot of representation out there? Like what, what, I mean, I know you have to do the studies and all that stuff, but like, what's your kind of like guesstimate out there? Well, um, that's a good question. It kind of comes back to like, we're at least for science communicators. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Cause I feel like I really don't know to be, to be honest. So, so, like, so, that's fine. So Corey, can you, can you rephrase the question? Uh, representation for who, like, who are we talking about? Science YouTubers essentially. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's specific. Right. So yeah. So I think, I think what something with the paper that I published recently and trying to like help educators make videos, like to make a video requires a huge learning curve, you know? Mm -hmm. So like if we're, we're, if other scientists or science enthusiasts, like our main goal is to kind of like do our education or do our research, like to pick up the camera and to focus on that or to like develop the skills and like how to produce like really well-made videos can often be like a, a huge learning curve and kind of like, you know, shy someone away. But right now I feel like our technologies and our phone make it easier for us, but it's still time consuming in terms of like thinking about the concept of writing the, writing the story, you know, actually filming the video and then having to edit it. And usually that's all done by individual content creators by themselves. So we think about that in terms of the other responsibilities because we can't really automatically get paid to produce this type of content. A lot of these content creators are doing it for free until they hit a certain level of followers or whatever to be able to get people to support them through patreon or through getting sponsorships or whatever but it still takes like for these guys that are making millions of views it took them 10 years to get there so it kind of feels like it's really hard to break into and not really a feasible career and more of like a hobby but it still requires a level of skill and a learning curve to overcome and so sometimes i feel like maybe that can be a, a deterrent but i feel like nowadays um, we're because we're pushing for more representation in media in general and in Hollywood. Now I feel like there's more people that are wanting to pick up the camera. TikTok makes it easier. Making videos on Instagram makes it easier. And so I feel like that's slowly starting to reduce. Um, but to make a higher production kind of video on YouTube, it still requires a level of effort that not everyone can put into. And, and do you know this from studies or your feeling and experience um, field experience? Field experience would just say for that, at least talking to other, like being in, in the YouTube, in the YouTube space and talking to other educators and talking to other scientists. Um, this is kind of like, you know, the thing that we kind of stumble upon. Yeah, like Corey, Corey just brought up like one of the main YouTube channels has um yeah, I looked into his research already and he looks into like misconceptions. Sure. Yeah, misconceptions yeah. And, and how that's used, but specifically for physics education. But it also took him as like being a person interested in film to want to study that where like that main lab was mostly into like science education in general and not actually media within science education. Yeah. And also they had the virtue of being in a YouTube space that was very immature. And now that market mm -hmm. is saturated. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So they, they, they were able to come up in a, a environment where low skill videos were permissible. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now the standards are the Veritasiums and yeah. the PBS Digital Studios that have funding to support these types of quality content. And, you know, everyone's always fighting against the YouTube algorithm. And so it's always hard to break through, especially as like an up and coming person. And um, 
again, you, like the, the perfect time to start a YouTube channel would have been 10 years ago. <laughs> and so it's a, like, you know, it's a little bit harder. So right now, most of the scientists are just doing it for fun or to develop their own brand and to develop their own presence. And, you know, I've used it as a portfolio for myself to kind of get me in this, in this space, in this position, but it's, I, it's not like a YouTube, it cannot be a feasible thing for me to do. <laughs> and so it's still very hard for even me, you know, for, for me to break into even as a researcher. And if we can quantify this, <laughs> I think it'd be fantastic, right? To actually, and I don't know, do you know other data sets out there that you that you could go get into yourself right now and and just see some of this uh, trends that you're talking about? Because you, you feel it on the field, absolutely. That's one thing, yes. But could we actually show it with data? Because I think that that will be actually really fascinating to see uh, the TikToks and the Insta story. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I think I don't. I've, I've yet to come by that database. I think the only thing that's ever looked into kind of like the uh, there's publications on like the like what makes a YouTube video popular, mm -hmm. who are the types of people that are commenting, or the analytics that kind of inform the popularity, and again, just like the gender gap, and that was kind of like the extent of what's kind of been published out there. So I feel like. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, as more and more people wanted to become content creators or see content creation as like a tool to expand their science communication like yeah there's tons of you know, a lot of people out there, so I think that could be something interesting to look into actually trying to quantify that. Yeah, and, and the people I think we had, we had a one of our first interns summer interns uh, two years ago looked at podcasts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. was trying to and was getting this U shaped curve a lot are born. Many die in the middle and a few survive, right? There's like a few that are, you know, science radio, like really, really impactful that are out there, daily GBH and so forth. Um, so yeah, there's, my goodness, there's too much in there. And I was like, <laughs> I gotta go now. My husband's like waiting for me for dinner. <laughs> awesome, okay. <laughs> this, is, this, this, this is good, this is good. This is why the SAI, I just love it. But thank you so much for sharing your insights, uh, Stephanie. We'll, we'll be in touch uh, shortly. And everybody, Ariana, Corey, thanks for the insights as well. Thank you. Thank you. This was lovely. Thank you again for inviting me into this space. Wonderful. Bye, everybody. Yeah.